the Wales and Environmental Studies major graduating in summer of 2023. He has previously served as Executive Director of Students Expressing Environmental Dedication. I think I have to go to the My hands are gonna hurt by the end of the night, that's okay. This summer, Will will be joining Dr. Yin Chu Wang's POE Study Abroad program to Taiwan, which is awesome. Very <laughs> good. Once he returns, he plans to pursue work at the intersection of urban forestry and environmental justice. And if this topic sounds particularly interesting to you, you are in luck because the title of Will's presentation is Urban Forestry. It is. Urban Forestry <laughs> Enabling Conditions for Equitable Municipal Tree Canopy. Social organization with the Nature Conservancy. His site supervisor there was Josh Lubinstein. Second advisor on campus was Ann Ryder of UW Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences. Let's give it up for Will. When you hear the phrase urban forestry, you might think of a walk in Ravenna Park or even the street trees in your own neighborhood. But have you ever wondered how these trees can thrive in a busy urban environment? That's where the practice of urban forestry comes in. Urban forestry is comprised of planting, maintaining and preserving trees on city lands. And while this may sound simple, there are nuances that come with each of these responsibilities. So, Who's doing the work? That would be the urban foresters themselves. When maintaining an entire city's tree canopy, a forester will need to contract private crews for help. When planting new trees, they need to consider neighborhoods with lower tree canopy. When enforcing tree ordinances, they need to administer fines that hold developers accountable. And this accountability can only be done through community engagement that promotes forestry-based education. For urban forestry to be equitable, it is also necessary to acknowledge redlining. Redlining is a discriminatory housing practice which deemed BIPOC neighborhoods as hazardous to white homeowners. You can see this practice in a 1929 map of Spokane that outlines these BIPOC neighborhoods in red. And while redlining is only one of the many racial disparities prominent in urban communities, these legacy effects continue to correlate with current tree canopy disparities today. So, with the complexities of urban forestry and its implications like redlining, I wanted to know how policy can support municipal urban forestry programs that equitably preserve and expand tree canopy. To answer this question, I worked with the Nature Conservancy, where my research consisted of three main steps, expert consultations, interviews with urban foresters, and a comparative policy analysis. I was able to speak with folks who helped me pinpoint what areas of urban forestry to research. And with this guidance, I looked at topics such as educational initiatives, tree ordinances, tree canopy distribution, and redlining. Through the advice of the experts I spoke with, I was able to pinpoint three canopy diverse cities, which led me to talk to the urban foresters of Ithaca, Renton, and Spokane where I asked them about the barriers and strengths to their work. Through my policy analysis, I found three root barriers these urban foresters face. Low staffing, bureaucratic obstacles, and low funding. These stem into challenging realities, which led me to five policy recommendations. First, forestry team staff needs to be expanded so that efforts of tree canopy maintenance, planting, and ordinance enforcement can be completed successfully. Second, educational initiatives need to be strengthened. This can be accomplished with the neighborhood council system where forestry programs can easily relay information to all communities in their city. Third, productive city collaboration must be fostered with forestry programs that help strengthen their ordinances to protect trees on public and private property. Fourth, urban foresters need to be able to enforce tree ordinances on their own accord. Without the ability to do so, existing protections for urban trees may be violated by commercial developers and private property owners. Finally, designated staffing and funding for tree planting and maintenance in BIPOC neighborhoods is necessary. 
Without these resources, urban forestry is not an equitable practice that addresses the needs of all communities. So when we look back on these group barriers of low staffing, bureaucratic obstacles, and low funding, we can address these realities with the five policy recommenda recommendations that I outlined to make for more productive urban forestry practices that are rooted in an expanded team staff, bureaucratic reforms, and increased funding. With these in place, there's potential for intersectional staffing, bureaucratic reforms, and increased funding. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> um, policy is a powerful tool and it must be used effectively so that urban communities forestry needs are adequately addressed. I'd like to thank my site supervisor, Josh Rubenstein, my faculty advisor and writer, my family, my friends, my awesome roommates here tonight, and my professors at the Program on the Environment that have helped me along the way. Thank you. Can I get some questions for Will? Sophia, yes. Our question for you. Four. Could you first describe in a little bit to exactly you know, what a tree ordinance is? And second, could you kind of explain some of the public health benefits from higher uh, tree canopy that are missing from the black communities? Definitely. Um, so to start, Sophia asked what a tree ordinance actually is. And essentially, a tree ordinance is a part of a city's zoning code, and it states where trees can and can't be planted um, as well as maintained and protected by a forestry department. Um, especially in urban communities, there's specific protections for landmark trees, some of which which are on public property and not many are on private property, which goes back to a root barrier of urban for forestry. Um, so really looking at trying to reform ordinances to address all trees in all areas. Um, and then your question about the public health implications of urban forestry. Um, trees are really valuable in urban areas to mitigate heat island effect. Um, they help increase air quality, especially in urban areas. Um, also mental well-being and mental health. Um, and that really ties back to the environmental justice aspect of this because um, in redline communities, they have less access to those ecosystem benefits. Maybe one more question for Will? Yes, in the back. Oh, sorry. The question was about socioeconomic limitations and correlating to redlining, why ha that hasn't been addressed. Um, I'd say it kind of goes back to the funding aspect. A lot of times forestry programs just can't focus on more interdisciplinary efforts of tree canopy expansion and focusing on communities that need it. Um, so I think it's just a matter of allocating more resources so we can focus, focus more on that. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much.